Okay, um, the topic is international monetary systems. If you've ever had a class in international economics or international finance, you're often told that there's two categories of international monetary systems. A, f a system of fixed exchange rates and a system of flexible exchange rates. And they've alternated over the years. Um, and what they usually do is they categorize the gold standard as a fixed exchange rate. And I'll show you why that's wrong in a while. It's a fixed exchange rate. All currencies, national currencies are tied to gold at a given price. And so their exchange rates between one another are fixed. And on the other hand, they include in fixed exchange rates these systems over here, uh, including the Bretton Woods system, which we had in the United States from 1946 to 1971, which is a phony gold standard. It wasn't a real gold standard at all. And um, even a world central bank that has been proposed by Ke some Keynesians. So this is sort of jarring. I mean, you know, th th this, this seems sort of inconsistent that you would have 100% gold standard in the same category as a Keynesian world central bank. And then they say the other, the other um, uh, types of systems are the floating exchange rates and um, or, or fluctuating exchange rates. So you have a freely floating exchange rate, which the monitors love. They love when national monies um, have their values determined with regard to one another in terms of supply and demand. So the monitors are basically saying that all money should be, should be monopolized by their own governments and the supply and demand for those monies should determine their values in terms of other similarly monopolized monies. Well, that's a false dichotomy. It's, it's, it, it, it's not a very good typology. The more fundamental difference between international exchange rates is that, or international monetary systems, is that some of them are based on market supplied money. Okay? Their monies are market monies. And so I've, I've categorized them in a different way, not according to fixed and fluctuating exchange rates, but according to those international money uh, monetary systems that are based on commodity money, such as gold and silver, and those that are based on government monopolized paper money, okay, which include a whole array of different systems, including the monetarist system, um, Keynesian systems, and uh, <clears throat> so this is sort of an Austrian typology, you might want to call it. It's not the standard typology that differentiates between fixed and, and fluctuating. The, the, the fundamental difference is between a market supplied money, which is a commodity, a real market commodity, and a um, government monopolized paper money. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not going to be able to get to that because it was written that. I, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Yeah, well, in that sense, yeah, sure. That's 100% gold standard, but he's talking about something different. Um, Okay, so this is the way I would categorize them. And so we go from good to, to really bad. Okay? Um, so what I want to do is go through a few of them. Uh, we'll start with one that actually existed. In, this actually existed as money grew up. We, this was sort of pre-central bank. It existed in the Middle Ages in Europe where you had gold coins and silver coins, privately minted, freely circulating. But uh, let's start with the formal classical gold standard, okay? And I'll, I'll just talk about some of their characteristics, and then we'll compare them to some of the government-monopolized fiat money um, systems and see why these invariably break down. This didn't break down. This was destroyed deliberately by governments during World War I, and then again, um, it was restored, not completely. It was a phony gold standard in the 1920s. Um, it was completely destroyed again in 1933. But again, it was difficult to have um, a system that was orderly without gold. So they tried to reinstate it again after World War II. We had the Bretton Woods system. And that was then just completely broke down. Okay, So the, the Keynesian systems and the mantra systems break down. The gold standard will continue to exist unless governments undermine it, unless they usurp it and destroy it. Okay. So let, 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 let me just talk a little bit about the um, characteristics of the classical gold standard. It wasn't a perfect standard, because government was involved to some extent. Um, you could have cl um, a classical gold standard with a central bank, as, as England did, Great Britain did, or without a central bank, which the U.S. did. Okay. 
um, the, the most important attribute of the gold standard is that the monetary unit is defined as a weight of gold. Okay, The unit is not the dollar. That's not money. That's simply the name for weight of gold. Same thing with the pound, the mark, the franc under the gold standard. To give you an example, from 1834 to 19... 19- 33, the U.S. dollar was defined as one twentieth of an ounce of gold. And it was an effective definition in the sense that people could go to their bank, go to a, to, to a, a treasury outlet, and turn in $20 and get an ounce of gold. It was free convertibility. Okay, That is, the government, to have a gold standard, had to stand ready, and the banks, to pay out gold on demand, or to pay out dollars, on demand at this rate, okay? Uh, the pound was defined from 1821 after the Napoleonic Wars until 1931 when the British government went off under Keynes' influence, went off the uh, gold standard. It was defined as a pound was equal to, this is a dollar, one dollar, pound was equal to one-fourth of an ounce of gold, which immediately explodes the myth that the gold standard uh, is a standard of fixed exchange rates. These aren't fixed exchange rates. The exchange rate between gold and the dollar for over 100 years was $4.86, plus or minus 1% for transportation, equal to one pound. The reason why was simple. There was five times the amount of gold in the pound, one-fourth of an ounce of gold, as it was in the dollar. So therefore, it took $5 to purchase one, one uh, pound. Why? Because... Five dollars equaled one quarter of an ounce of gold, and one pound equaled one quarter of an ounce of gold. If you claim that that's a fixed exchange rate, then then you're telling me that um, one quarter, or uh, one quarter equals five nick. Let's say uh, one quarter is equal to five nickels, and that's a fixed exchange rate. But that's not a fixed exchange rate. That's just the laws of arithmetic. One quarter is defined as one fourth of a dollar. One nickel is defined as one twentieth of a dollar. Okay? Five twentieths equal one quarter. Okay? Yes. Because this wasn't exactly one twentieth of an ounce. It was, it was defined in terms of grains. Okay? It, it was very close. But, okay. So, that's the first myth. There is, the gold standard is not a fixed exchange rate. Okay? All, so, just as in the U.S. today, the dollar is one currency area. The same thing was true of the gold standard. The gold was the world money, or at least the money of those countries that had a gold standard. They're, they didn't have different monies. They simply had different monetary units, different weights of gold, okay, as their monetary unit. But they all had the same currency. They all had the same money. So the gold standard brought about a system of a single currency internationally. Okay, just as we have a single currency nationally today. We don't distinguish between Pennsylvania dollars and New Jersey dollars and California dollars and so on. Okay, so that was the first important point about the gold standard. The second point um, is that the purchasing power of money was the same the world over. Okay, a gold ounce could buy the same in England as it could buy in the U.S. or tended to buy the same. Okay, if that weren't the case then people would you take gold, it, let's say if prices were higher in the U.S., that means that gold cannot buy as much in the U.S. as it could buy in England. So, if prices were higher in the U.S., gold would flow out of the U.S. into Great Britain to purchase the lower price goods. As that happened, prices in Great Britain would rise as people spent that extra gold on goods. And in the other hand, on the other hand, in the U.S., as gold flowed out and people had less gold, prices would fall until they came to an equilibrium. Now, does that mean that the price of a house, let's say the price of a townhouse in London was exactly equal to the price of a townhouse in New York? No. This only applies to transportable goods. Non-transportable goods, which could still be purchased, are simply different goods. So, for example, I tell my, my MBA classes in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in New York where I teach at Pace University, and we were three blocks from where the World Trade Center used to stand, and there used to be a great restaurant uh, right at the top of the World Trade Center. You could just you had a great vista. It was all glass, and it turned. Um, beer, glass of beer at the top of the World Trade Center was now seven or eight dollars a glass. 
glass at McNulty's Pub a few blocks away in Wall Street was $3 a glass. Why didn't everybody rush to the elevators, go down and, and, and equilibrate the value of money? Because dollars bought much more beer, right? $3 for a beer and, uh, you know, three blocks away and, and $8 for a beer at the top of the World Trade Center. Because they're different goods. You get the beer plus the great Vista, okay? The same thing is true. I'm going down to, to the New Jersey Shore for vacation next week. If you go on the boardwalk and you buy a sausage sandwich on the boardwalk, it costs you like, you know, $12. If you go a couple blocks away to a family restaurant, that same sausage sandwich would cost you 5 or $6, okay? Why? Well, because you're taking the whole atmosphere of the, of the boardwalk, okay? And, and, and the view of the ocean and so on. Okay, so that doesn't mean that the value of money isn't uh, in equilibrium. It certainly is. On the other hand, if there was no difference, if space made no difference to the goods, the goods had the same prices throughout the world. So, throughout the gold standard area, money was always in equilibrium. The reason why was because there was really no cost of shipping money because of the foreign exchange market. There was a cost of shipping goods, but, but money had the same value in all parts of the world because of the very sophisticated um, mechanisms for using foreign exchange. You didn't actually have to ship the gold. Okay, you, you did after a while, but but what what you could do is you could buy um, a, a a bill or you could buy um, a claim on a, on a foreign bank deposit, okay, and and pay for your goods if you're going to import them from from uh, Great Britain. Now, um, the second thing is that the classical gold standard really, even when there was a central bank, very narrowly limited the ability of the central bank to bring about an inflation. The classical gold standard was often called the golden handcuffs. It handcuffed the government. All right, and let me just give you an example of what I mean here. Um, you can look on the classical, and this was a problem with the classical gold standard to some extent. You can look on the classical gold standard as an inverted pyramid. Can people see that low? Okay. Um, at the bottom of the pyramid was gold. Okay. Now this was um, f- this was the result of fractional reserve b- uh, banking. So I, let's say that um, in the case of gold. We had the central banks holding $2 billion worth of gold, which is 40% of its liabilities. Based on this gold, it can then issue two and a half times five, $2 billion in its own notes and deposits. So you then had central bank notes and deposits, which it issued, of $5 billion. So the gold reserve was 40%. But then these bank, central bank notes and deposits were used by the commercial banks, the banks that, that, that individual citizens like you and I dealt with, the public dealt with, to back their own liabilities. Their liabilities were their own notes. Uh, banks were permitted to, to issue notes in the United States until the 1920s. They were heavily taxed after, after the Civil War, but there were still banks issuing their own notes. So today, banks can only issue checking deposits, which are used in money. They're not permitted to use, uh, issue their own notes. We have to use Federal Reserve notes. But up until the 1920s, they could actually issue their own notes. And in Great Britain, banks could issue their own notes and so on that competed with the central bank's notes. So people tended to use the notes and deposits of their own bank. So let's say their own bank then had $5 billion in their vaults of the central bank notes and deposits. And so these commercial banks uh, issued notes and deposits. So when I say deposits, I mean checking deposits. Notes are the, the paper notes. And let's say they kept 20% reserves. So, if they had the $5 billion, which tended to accumulate in their vaults, then they could issue $25 billion. That was the money supply of the country. Money supply of the country was equal to $25 billion. Okay. So, it was not... The classic gold standard was not a 100% gold standard, and that was a flaw. But it still worked fairly well. The reason is a very... um, Seemingly sophisticated word called the price specie. Specie refers to gold and silver coin. Price specie flow mechanism. That's what it's called in economics, but it has a simple explanation. What would happen <clears throat> if the U.S., <clears throat> rather, it, let's say if the Bank of England inflated its notes and deposits? Okay. Let's say they um, went from, um, they added what. One billion. Okay, so they inflated. They wanted to either drive down the interest rate or they wanted to um, monetize government debt. That is, they want to buy government bonds. <clears throat> so they issued these uh, notes and deposits, and they got into the banking system. 
as the people that were, that were paid these notes and deposits, let's say for the bonds, deposit them in their banking system, the banks then were able to multiply them according to the, the, the deposit expansion multiplier by five times. That means that with an extra $1 billion, if you're holding 20%, that $1 billion can support how much of, of commercial bank notes and dollars? $5 billion. Okay. So the money supply suddenly increases to $5 billion. Okay. Now we have $30 billion. What happens to that extra money? What do people do with it? They spend it. And let's say this is the U.S. They spend it on goods and services. As goods and services rise by about 20% in the U.S., what happens to the value of money in the U.S. compared to Great Britain, France, Germany, and so on? Goes down. We have 20% inflation. Gold buys less in the U.S. than it does elsewhere. So guess what happens? U.S., this is the price specific flow mechanism. If initially exports equaled imports so that no money was leaving the country or coming into the country, so that everything was in equilibrium, so that the U.S. price level... P-U-S equal the world price level, P-W, okay? That's equilibrium, where, where the prices are, are generally, uh, except for spatial considerations, which I talked about, prices are generally equal. Suddenly, U.S. prices go up, and they're greater than world prices, okay? So, this is the price me flow mechanism, okay? And I'll, I'll actually maybe just erase a little bit of this and show you how it works. So, here's what happens. There's an increase in the money supply... In the U.S., it drives U.S. prices up, okay? Um, let me stick in here. Above world prices, that leads to U.S. importing more because it's world, world goods are cheaper. So U.S. imports rise, but U.S. prices are going up. What happens to U.S. exports? Go down. U.S. exports go down. So we get to the following. We have a balance of payments, what? Deficit, which simply means, we have a balance of payments deficit, it means that exports are now less than imports. Okay? We are spending more on foreign goods than, 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 than is being spent for us. Now, on our goods. Do foreigners want our dollars and, che and checking accounts in American banks? No, they want gold. So let's say this is equal to $1 billion. People turn their notes in and demand gold for the central, from, from the commercial bank. The commercial bank then has to take some of its central bank notes and begin to, uh, one billion of them in fact, and begin to ask for gold. And now what happens to the amount of gold in the U.S. Treasury? Starts to fall. Goes down to one billion. If it keeps inflating, what's going to happen to that gold? They're going to lose all of it and, and the gold standard is going to break down. Well, they don't do, they don't want, you know, initially under the classical gold standard, they didn't want to uh, have the gold standard break down, okay? Wasn't until wartime, World War, uh, Civil War in the U.S. and then the World War One, but during um, um, normal times, everyone realized the gold standard was the most efficient system. Yeah, for the point of information. Yeah, I'm sorry. Pr uh, price here. This uh, that's uh, imports from U.S. for U.S. go up, exports for U.S. go down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's, I mean, we don't have, our, we're talking about classical gold standard. Um, they realized that that w led to, to prosperity and, and so on. And, and, and there was an ideology in the country that gold was money. So any government that tried to go off the gold standard, unless it was in terms of uh, an emergency, would, would face a lot of opposition from the pu public and from the other party. And in the U.S., the Democratic Party, believe it or not, in the, in, was the, the party of the working people um, in, in, in the 19th century. And they were very super pro-gold standard. It was always Republicans, which was the party of big business and the commercial interests that wanted cheap paper money so they get the, the loans at low rates. Okay, so to make, so then to avoid all of this, of course, the central bank then has to begin to reduce its expansion. So it reduces this. What happens? Prices begin to fall in the U.S. again, and gold falls flows back in, and, and so. It really never gets to this point where they laugh, lose half their gold. Okay, so the gold, the the, the the price specie flow mechanism keeps the money supplies pretty much in equilibrium. Okay, if any any particular central bank inflates much much more than others, they lose a lot of gold. They have to raise their interest rate, cut back on their loans, um, and that causes a reduction of the, their notes and deposits. And then that causes the commercial banks to have less reserves and to reduce the money supply. Okay. 
So the money supply is keeping equilibrium because of that. And that's why it's called the golden handcuffs. It worked very well. It works today in the U.S. We have the price species flow mechanism working right at this moment. Okay? Does anyone worry about gold flowing out of, 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 of Washington State going to, to California or fl- flowing out of New Jersey or going to New York? Do we, do we know if there's balance of payments deficits between these states? We don't know. We don't care. First of all, the government doesn't collect any statistics, which is good. But secondly, this mechanism works so well that whatever money does flow out is precisely money that people would rather spend than hold. Okay? So the gold the price VC flow mechanism doesn't just work between nations. It works between regions, states, towns, and even households. Okay? So it's a very powerful mechanism, and uh, it kept things, kept the central bank in check. Okay. Um, a couple other things I want to say about the uh, gold standard. The so-called balance of payments crises where gold was flowing out was precisely the way of preventing governments from inflating too much. A balance of payments crisis was good, okay? They couldn't get away with with continually printing um, more notes and deposits, more paper money, without losing gold. And that was the check on them. They would always complain about it, of course, but but they would have but they they always knew how to stop it. You stopped it by Re, uh, stopping the, the, the printing of paper money or actually reversing it so that we had deflations. Um, okay. What happened to this great system? Oh, one last thing. Was there a growth in the money supply? Yes, the money supply did increase over time. It only increased in two ways, though, okay, in the long run. In the long run, if you had gold mines like the U.S. and some other countries did, then it would increase at the rate of increase in, 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 in gold mining. However, even gold, you couldn't keep all the gold that you were producing in the country. Why? Because as new gold was discovered, as it was in the U.S., um, new sources of gold in uh, 1849, then again in 1896 in Alaska, 1849 out west, um, you had prices going up. So the gold would always be spread over the world. Everybody's money supply would increase. The second way of increasing your money supply was if you were an economy like the U.S. economy that was growing very fast after the Civil War, as you had more goods and services being produced as the U.S. industrialized, the prices of goods and services, just like the price of of hand calculators and, and, and personal computers and HDTVs are coming down, as your prices fell, foreigners would want to buy more of those goods. So because you had more goods in your country, gold would flow in. So the, the money supply increased very slowly, but prices of goods fell because the amount of goods in the economy increased even more quickly. Right? So under the gold standard, prices in the U.S. in 1896, before we discovered gold in Atlanta, uh, in Alaska, excuse me, that would be great, if you, um, was, was just as high as they were in 1834 when we went on the gold standard, or even you know, in, 17, in 1790, I think, when uh, we had a gold and silver standard. Prices were no higher and were actually a little bit lower than they were earlier. So prices tended to fall, especially during the 1880s when we had tremendous growth in the U.S. economy. It was the highest decade of growth in the U.S. in U.S. history. And prices fell by 2 or 3% every year. Right. Okay, so that's the classical gold standard. It worked. It worked well. It kept, we had inflation and we had, we had business cycles. We had some um, depressions, but they were very short and... Um, they were over very quickly. Then what happened? Well, 19, uh, World War I occurs. Every single belligerent nation, Germany, France, Great Britain, within two weeks of the outbreak of the war, goes off the gold standard. The reason why they go off the gold standard? Because in wars, especially modern wars, are extremely expensive. So that they wanted to hide the true costs of the war from their um, um, populations. And the way to do that the easiest way to see the true cost of the war is if you force the government to pay for the war by raising taxes. Then they have to raise taxes tremendously. Instead of 10% of your, in, your income, whatever they were taking, then they have to take 50%. And that is extremely unpopular. Wars, the, the kings, when, when, before there was paper money, kings would have to stop their wars. Their armies were in the field because they couldn't pay the armies anymore. They didn't have any more gold. So wars would just stop because the king, king ran out of money and they'd just go home and that was it. Okay? And that was really cool. Um, but with paper money, you just simply print the money and pay. And that's, what, and that's what all the countries did. When we got into the war in 1917, 
we, we semi went off the gold standard. We didn't allow any gold to be exported out of the country so that we could, we could just print money to pay for the war. All right, so we go off the gold standard and, um, the U.S. sort of goes back on almost right away after the war and then uh, other countries, it takes a long time for other countries to go on back onto the gold standard because they've inflated so much. Germany has had this tremendous hyperinflation. Great Britain has, has, has um, inflated a great deal. So they go back on the gold standard in 1925 to 1931. Um, but the problem here is that it's a phony gold standard. Uh, gold coins are no longer in circulation. The people are no longer using gold coins along with the notes and so on. In Great Britain, it's called the gold bullion standard. The only people that could get gold from the central banks are people that are importing goods from abroad. And they can only get very expensive bars of gold. There are no more coins in, in, in Great Britain. In the U.S., we have um, a, a gold standard. And you can theoretically get coins, but... There's a propaganda campaign against using gold. You're considered to be old-fashioned if you use gold, uh, and not, you know, modern people use, you know, paper, paper uh, notes. You have the Federal Reserve that came into being in 1914, and that's really a, a, a branch of the federal government. So people trust paper money more now, and so you don't have much gold coin circulating. You also have a, um, a system where all the other countries, like Germany. Uh, and um, the Eastern European countries, when they go back on the gold standard, they no longer hold gold in their treasuries. They hold U.S. dollars and British pounds. That's why it's called the gold exchange standard. They hold foreign exchange. So their money is backed up by pounds and dollars, and pounds and dollars are backed up by gold. Okay. Uh, we then have, uh, and that doesn't stop, we have a lot of inflation as a result of that. And then we have the, um, the uh, stock market boom, and we have the Great Depression. Great Britain goes off the gold standard in 1931, the U.S. in 1933. The U.S. government passes a law that, imp- that compels all American citizens to turn in their gold for paper money unless they are licensed dentists or jewelers, okay? You can't, or, or if you're a numismatist, a coin collector, okay? But you cannot use gold any longer as money by law. So they steal 260 million ounces from the American people. And, and they also depreciate the value of the dollar. They now say it's only worth $35 per ounce, or 1 35th of an ounce of gold, instead of 1 20th of an ounce of gold. So from 1933, we have this chaotic system. From 1933 to the end of World War II, you, you, have, um, you have, especially in the 30s, countries in the Depression trying to make their money cheaper, trying to inflate their money supplies, drive down the value of their money so that they can sell more goods. So if the U.S., for example, tries to make the value of the dollar less in terms of pounds and German marks and francs, that means that with the lower value of the dollar, people need fewer of their own units of money to buy a U.S. sweater or to buy U.S. wheat. But, of course, they... Everybody responds in the same way. Everybody says, well, if the U.S. is going to drive the value of its currency down, we're going to inflate and try to drive the value of our currency down so that we can sell more of our goods. Everybody is trying to export more so that they can have more jobs during the Depression and import less. So you have a lot of tariffs. You, you, you hardly have any, any foreign investment anymore. And you have what's called competitive devaluation. Everybody's trying to make their currency worth less on the market on the foreign exchange market by printing more of it. Okay, so that's not. But but if if you drive yours down by twenty percent and somebody else then increases his inflation rate so that it falls, then the the exchange rate stays the same and nobody has the advantage. So it keeps going on. It's a race to the bottom. Yes, devalue. Yeah. Yes. No, no. I, I just I, I forget about this. I mean, just they want less. They want less of uh, less of these and more of these. Okay, they want less exports and more imports. Because uh, I'm sorry, they want le- less imports and more exports. Because exports create jobs. Of course, it makes the consumers poor, right? If you're keeping out foreign goods, make them more expensive for consumers. Consumers are, are getting hurt during the Great Depression because of this. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Chinese go- government is it, it was undervaluing its currency, making it cheaper that, to, to have more exports, which is great for American consumers. But the U.S. government is continuously bashing the Chinese government. Why? If they want to send us, you know, clothing and other things at 80% of the true value, 
then they're taking resources from their own people and sending them to us for free. I'll take it. No, it's, it's, it's a great thing. All right, let me just go, go on and I'll, I'll come back. Unless you, okay, real quick. Yeah. No, because you have to devalue, you have to print more money. Yeah. Right. Oh, oh yeah, in a sense of cause of, yeah. Yeah. What happens is that your currency goes down in value first, and later on the, the prices go up, and that does counteract the cheap, the, the, the cheaper exports. So, yeah, it's a time factor. Okay? That's a good point. Okay, yeah, last quick question. Okay. Yeah. Logic, why they do it? <coughs> they do it because they want more jobs. It's the Great Depression, right? So they want to have more exports because that increases the demand for labor in the home country. Even though it's making your consumers poorer and poorer because they have to pay higher and higher prices for imports. Okay? So you want to make the foreign goods more expensive, you want to make your goods cheaper. That's the basic logic of it. Okay? I want, I want to go on and then I'll, I'll come back to your question. Um, okay, so, the Allies, now, in 1944, they know they're going to beat Germany, and they, they, they meet uh, at a place called Bretton Woods, a beautiful resort in um, New Hampshire. So, where's the Bretton Woods system here? And they realize that the, syst- the chaotic system they had from 1933 uh, until that, that present day there was just not viable any longer. Okay, So, they, they want to restore gold in some way. Okay, So, they... The British government and the U.S. government are the, are the two strongest allies here, and they send their 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 um, treasury representatives. In um, case of Great Britain, it was J.M. Keynes. Case of the U.S., it was the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury Harry Dexter White, later proved to be uh, a Soviet spy. And they come with these two plans. Keynes wants to have sort of a paper gold system where gold really doesn't play much of a role. He wants, he wants a world central bank to issue paper money uh, uh, to deficit countries that, that can't pay their bills. Basically, Great Britain had become a deficit country. And he called it the bank whore, which is bank notes, and uh, I believe this is this is um, uh, root of a foreign word for gold. Okay, um, And White comes with a plan called the UNITA. They want the issuance of, of sort of a special currency by sort of a world type organization. So there's a big argument and so on. We don't get that. We get something called the Bretton Woods system, which has the um, International Monetary Fund. Okay? It doesn't issue it doesn't issue any paper money, but it does establish a system in which the US dollar now becomes the only dollar or the only currency that is convertible into gold. So the U.S. dollar becomes what's called a key currency. The U.S. dollar is set at a value of $35 per ounce of gold. Now, that doesn't mean that any American citizen can come with $35 to the bank or to the treasury and get an ounce of gold. For domestic citizens, the the um, dollar is inconvertible. Only foreign institutions, foreign central banks and government, can transform their dollars into gold, into large bars of gold, okay? So, the U.S. dollar is backed by gold, at least internationally, not national, not internally, and all other currencies, the franc, the pound, the German mark, and so on, Italian lira, are all backed by, guess what? The U.S. dollar. Now, this has tremendous, p- tremendously perverse incentives for the U.S. government, okay? Um... We now have another sort of pyramid. Looks like this. Now you have gold down here. You have the Federal Reserve. So you have Fed notes here. The Fed's printing notes and deposits. And those notes and deposits become the reserves of U.S. commercial banks. Okay. And so that the money, so the U.S. money supply, USM, um, is in the form of Federal Reserve notes that people are using for everyday transactions of cash, plus the checking accounts at the Fed. But guess what? All the foreign countries are backing their money with bank deposits in the U.S. So then you have foreign M's. They're at the top of the pyramid. So, every time the Federal Reserve System expands its notes and deposits, our money supply increases, our prices go up, but do we lose gold? No. 
All that happens is that this money goes to foreign countries. These dollars go to foreign countries in exchange for their goods. So we're, we're, we're printing up paper and buying real goods. And what do they do with the paper? The people who sell the goods to the U.S. go with the U.S. dollars and checks, and they put them in their central banks. Central banks give them their own currency, so their currency expands. So the U.S. then creates a worldwide inflation. And foreign governments are now piling up dollars. Now, initially, why would they want to do this? Well, initially, the U.S. had a lot of gold, had most of the gold in the world. Um, I think more than half of you know all the gold in existing, existing in the world. So in, to give you an example, in 1950, we have the U.S. gold stock here, and we have foreign dollars, dollars held by foreign central banks and governments, okay, that we had sworn to pay in gold. You had the following: there was we had something like 25 billion dollars worth of gold, and foreign governments had only $12 billion of dollar liabilities. And they knew that the gold could not be claimed by American citizens, so there was more than enough gold to, to cover the foreign liabilities. However, what's the incentive? You can inflate, and prices in your country will not continue, will rise, but most of that money will flow out and be held by foreign central banks, who will not demand gold. They'll simply back their increased money supplies with your dollars. So over time, what happens is that some gold does flow out of the U.S. Some gold, you know, foreign governments over time do demand gold, especially after, after the Vietnam War begins, and we begin inflating like crazy. So that by 19, in the 1960s, mid-60s or so, things have changed radically. We only have $12 billion, lost half our gold already, and... The rest of the world has 50 to 60 billion dollars of liabilities. Now everybody's getting nervous. The U.S. is trying to pay for both President Johnson's war on poverty, all the welfare programs, <clears throat> and the Vietnam War, which is heating up in 1965, without, without raising taxes. We don't want to raise taxes, right? Because the war would become very unpopular. The Vietnam War would have stopped after a few years if they had to pay for, by raising taxes. So they don't raise taxes. Nor do they raise taxes to pay for the um, a, a war on poverty. And President Johnson coined a phrase, or his advisors do, which is called, uh, which, which goes as follows: that the U.S. can enjoy both guns and butter. We can have more consumer goods and more and more defense um, equipment and so on to fight the war. Well, guess who's actually paying for all of that? France, Great Britain, and so on. We keep printing dollars. Those dollars are raising prices here and then flowing out of the country, and so we're importing. Well, while the government is using a lot of our resources to fight these wars or to transfer them via uh, um, the, the various welfare programs, the U.S. consumers are, are simply buy, taking that extra money and buying goods from foreigners. So, so they're losing real goods to us and taking paper. Plus, they're not sure they can get their gold back now. So France, in particular, demands its gold. And, um, we, 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 and, and Germany, too. Since Germany is still an occupied country... All well, the U.S. troops there. We blackmail Germany. We basically say, look, if you really want your gold back, yes, we'll give it to you, but then we're not going to be able to afford to defend you from the Russians. Okay? So we black, we, and we did that to, to, to France. France says basically up yours. They drop out of NATO and they build their own nuclear force because they don't want to be blackmailed by the U.S. and they demand their gold and they get it. And so gold keeps falling. Then two things happen. In 1968, there's a, a run on gold. Even though U.S. citizens can't own gold, can't buy gold legally, or even own it in a foreign country, we weren't even able to own uh, gold, let's say, in a safety deposit box in Canada. You couldn't even buy it there and own it. It was against the law. Um, but people in London, there's free gold markets in London and Zurich. So they're taking all these extra dollars that are, that are flowing into, into, into Europe, and they're buying gold, and they push the price of gold above $35 an ounce, which is embarrassing for the American government. Suddenly, the dollar is losing value in terms of gold. So in order to stop that from happening, what do we have to do? We have to give gold to the Bank of England, give gold to Switzerland, and to, to buy up those dollars. So we're losing more gold. It happens again in 1971. In, after 1968, the U.S. says something like, um, let's all get together and we'll agree we'll never buy gold from private markets. We'll only 
trade gold among ourselves. So this is a, called a two-tier system. Basically, it's, it's to prevent the U.S. government from having to, to lose more of its gold stock. But by 1971, the gov- other governments really want their gold. Um, we, ha- it's, we have $9 billion. They have $80 billion of claims. They don't trust that the U.S. government is ever going to pay this off. Um, so they're, they're demanding their gold. And we're, we're paying. And there's, we have two weeks left of gold. Within two weeks, all gold will be gone. So at that point, President Nixon goes on television and closes the gold window, and he, and he, and he reneges on the solemn pledge to redeem the U.S. dollar in gold. So the whole phony gold system collapses. And by the way, this was predicted by the Austrian economists. They said, this is a ridiculous system. The U.S. has no incentive not to inflate because the price specie flow mechanism doesn't what? Doesn't work. We don't lose gold when we inflate. All that happens is that the foreign governments accept this inflated paper money. And uh, one of the French economists that is av- advising the, the French president, Charles de Gaulle, um, and is saying, demand your gold, get your gold out, the U.S. can't pay. He's a follower of Mises. His name is Jacques Rueff. He's predicting from like 1958 that the whole thing's going to collapse. It's like a house of cards. That this whole thing, the gold's going to become so narrow here that the whole thing is going to tip over, which it did. And he says that the reason why is because the U.S. is allowed to run a deficit without tears. Only a, a Frenchman can come up with something like that. It's a beautiful statement. You can run deficits forever. Okay? As long as the people are willing to take your paper money and give you real goods, you can run deficits forever. Well, Europe got tired of it. And the whole thing collapsed. Okay? So what do we get after that? Um, we got uh, another crappy system it was called um, it lasted 13 months President Nixon um, who was not a crook uh, or said he wasn't a crook um, uh, called it the greatest monetary agreement in the history of the world no one's ever even heard of it anymore I mean, it's called the, the Smithsonian Agreement and there um, there what happens is that everyone is supposed to keep their, their, their currencies fixed in terms of the dollar even though we'll never pay gold. There's no gold anymore in the system. That breaks down within 13 months, because the U.S. keeps inflating, of course. Um, and so we, we can't hold the value of our money at such a level that the exchange rates are justified. Our, our exchange rate keeps just downward pressure. So finally, we go to um, a sort of uh, a system where there's dirty, a dirty float. It's called a dirty float. Where all the different governments from about 1973 onward are trying to keep their, 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 their exchange rates at a certain level, and then other governments are trying to keep theirs lower, and then th- there's the same type of problem you had in the 1930s. So finally, uh, the monetarists, like Milton Friedman said, said, say, and, and by the way, they were against Bretton Woods too. In their favor, you have to say the monetarists, like the Austrians, didn't think Bretton Woods could, could, could continue. But the monetarists, they don't want a gold standard. They want to go to complete floating exchange rates. They say, look, if a country wants to inflate, let them. What we're going to do is just allow their currency to depreciate. Okay? Their currency will depreciate. And so very inflationary governments will have very low exchange rates. Um, and, and, gov- and governments that have much more, um, are much more prudent and responsible, they'll have a very tight monetary policy. They'll increase the money supply very slowly. And their the value of their currencies will increase in value. Okay, so they claim you'll never have any more balance of payments crises. No one will ever ever worry about their exchange rates anymore, and you'll have a, what they claim is a free market money. But of course, it's still money that's whose supply is controlled by government, so it's not really free market. And they then go on and say that this is this is really a dream. So they they um, or this is the ideal. So this exists for about three or four years, and it doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is that they forgot about a few things. Um, oh, they also said you can hold your price level stable. You don't have to keep... One country can't, can't export inflation to another country because there's no gold that flows out and increases the... Or, or paper money that flows from one country to the next and increases paper and increases the price level. Because each um, country, simply, if, if it's inflating, all that happens is that the value of its currency falls to offset the increase in prices. So this seems like, it, you know, it could work, but they forgot a few, a few things. Um, 
First of all, now they've given the government complete control of the money supply. They don't even have to be worried about any kind of balance of payments crises. Even under Bretton Woods, the U.S. was worried about losing gold. Okay, And that kind of restrained them. So after 1971, you'll see tremendous increase in, 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 in world inflation. Because every government now can simply inflate without having any consequences. All that will happen is that their, 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 their um, exchange will depreciate very slowly. Okay, They won't have to go off the gold standard. They won't have to devalue. Devalue is when you cha- deliberately change the value of your currency in terms of other currencies or gold. Depreciation is when there are no fixed exchange rates and it just depreciates. So it depreciates every day over time and, and no one gets upset about it. So that's one thing that the mantras didn't count on, that it made inflation much easier. Secondly, um, as we know, under a democracy, everybody has a huge incentive. All governments have a huge incentive to inflate. Because the way you get reelected is by increasing spending. Okay, so you increase your spending on on farm programs. You increase your spending on on defense, so that uh, you know, the, the people who work in defense firms and and the stockholders make contributions and 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 vote for you. Um, but you don't want to increase taxes, okay? Because when you increase taxes, that's unpopular. So you don't want to finance increased spending by increasing taxes. If you increase borrowing. You drive up interest rates if you borrow from the public. So that's no good either because when you drive up interest rates, people can't afford houses and cars or they, they become less affordable. So what do you do? You increase the money supply. So when you increase the money supply, and you know you can increase the money supply very easily, you run more, more budget deficits. So all these countries begin to run huge budget deficits, including the U.S. during the Reagan era in the 1980s when we have floating exchange rates. They increase... Budget deficits tremendously because they know that they can increase the money supply to pay for these budget deficits. Okay, So budget deficits go up under the floating exchange rates. Um, third, the U.S., to give you an example of the third thing, the U.S. has a problem with its automobile industry. It's, it's very, very inefficient. It's been protected. And from 1981 to 1985... The real problems in the auto industry, Chrysler almost was out of business in 1981, has to be bailed out. Ford and GM are losing a lot of money. So they go to the Reagan administration and they, they, they want relief. The Reagan administration restricts the amount of Japanese cars that can be allowed in. The monitors claim this would never happen, that under floating exchange rates, all that would happen is that the exchange rate would, would change and nothing would, no one would ever want tariffs anymore. But they want tariffs. And not only that, they also want the U.S. to increase the money supply to depreciate the U.S. dollar and make it cheaper so that people buy more foreign cars, or more American cars. Because it's now you can get, do- you get dollars more cheaply, so therefore the cars are cheaper in terms of, of foreign currencies. So from 1985 to 1987, the U.S. government pushes the value of the dollar down tremendously to sell more cars. So the monetarists are wrong about that too. Okay, That people w- will not worry about deficits and and... Uh, will not uh, um, lobby for more tariffs and so on. Okay. All right, so th- this doesn't work. So what do we go to? We go back to dirty floating, which is what we've had up until the present. Uh, no one's satisfied with it. Um, and we get a bunch of Keynesian proposals, and I'll just I'll end with these real quickly. Um, yeah, we've got five minutes. Everybody realizes, you know, all, all the plans always go back to the gold standard. No matter how much people um, deride the gold standard and say, oh, you know, it caused a lot of recessions during the 1800s and so on, they all want to reinstate some form of the gold standard. So we have um, a system, uh, a number of proposals by these Keynesian economists during the 1980s and 90s, and I'll just give you a few. And um, one, one of them is by two, two, one former IMF bureaucrat and one former Carter administration bureaucrat. It's called... The crawling target zone. I mean, it's, you know, it sounds like a 1950 science fiction movie. Okay, and with or without soft buffers. Okay. okay, only a bureaucratic mind can come up with this nonsense. And what they're saying is, well, we want kind of fixed exchange rates, but we want to allow them to fluctuate by 10 percent, plus or minus 10 percent. Okay, so that if if a country is inflating too much, well, then it's 
its currency will drop by 10%. And when it drops to the, the limit of 10%, well then we'll, you know, the IMF will tell them they got to do something about it. Big deal. The IMF's going to, you know, tell them to do something about it. Um, uh, and we'll try to keep it within 10% because we'll get all the government, they always want to get governments and central banks together. We'll get everybody together and we'll all try to increase spending in our eco- separate economies by the same percent. If we do that, then all the, all the various current uh, exchange rates should stay within that range. Okay. So basically, what's that, what is that saying? It's saying that you want all co- co- countries to do what? inflate at the same rate. If they all inflate at the same rate, no one currency is going to lose value against other currencies. But all currencies are going to lose value against what? Goods and gold. Sure. Okay? Goods are going to become more and more expensive in all countries. Okay, so that's nonsense. Uh, another nonsensical system that's, been, that's proposed by uh, an economist from Stanford called Ronald, Mc, named Ronald McKinnon is he likes the gold standard. See, he likes the gold standard, so he wants a gold standard without gold. So he doesn't like gold, but he likes the gold standard. Okay, you, you figure that one out. Um, here he says that uh, we're going to act just like the gold standard. We're going to get the, the German mark, now the euro, um, the dollar, and the yen, and we're going to get them in a narrow band. Okay, we're going to keep you know, um, exchange rates very close, maybe plus or minus 2%, whatever. And the way we're going to do that is that every day we're going to consult and we're going to change our short-term interest rates, basically the Fed funds rate in the U.S., okay? And we're going to change them together. So again, he wants all governments to basically inflate together, okay? So, so again, they're focused not on gold in stopping inflation, but on gold in stopping what? All these fluctuating exchange rates, okay? Which isn't as important as stopping inflation. Then the, the third uh, economist is from Yale, and, and Ivy League economists all, are, tend always to be the worst on this stuff, just comes right out and says he really wants a world central bank. Not to issue money, but only to issue reserves. So what would happen is that governments would issue bonds, would borrow, and they would borrow from this world central bank. And the world central bank would, would give out, depending on the size of the country, the spending of the government, certain amount of reserves. And based on those reserves... Everybody's reserves would increase. They would print money, their own currencies, on the basis of those reserves. So if you're increasing all bank reserves together, which is pretty much what they want to do, what's going to happen to inflation? Everybody's going to inflate at the same rate, and you're going to have no problem with exchange rates. So what they, all these plans want to do is make inflation easier, not harder. They want to make inflation easier. Okay? Because the one good thing about exchange rates moving it, you know, against one another, and, and going up and down in a very volatile manner, even though it interferes with trade and investment, it's hard to, for businessmen to calculate all this stuff, in addition to calculating their regular profits and losses. The one good thing about that is at least people can take their money from, from, from countries that are inflating a lot and are losing value and put it in countries that are less inflationary. Now, if you have a world central bank, there's no possibility. Now there's no way to escape, okay, unless you buy gold, okay? So that's the um, the final plan of the world, and this is what Keynes always wanted. He wanted the world central bank. So um, what would the Austrians do? Go all the way back here to the left, and go all the way back here, and so the whole world would would would, would be. Uh, we don't have any time to go into how you would do this, but but get the whole world on a system where, just like in the U.S., gold is the money that everyone uses, and there's no balance of payments crises, no changes in in exchange rates. And there's hardly any inflation because gold increases at a very slow rate. Okay, I, I, all right, take two questions very quickly in the back, the two of the people in the back. What's going on right now? Um, well, I don't think we have conscious, too much conscious competitive devaluation, though. The Chinese are undervaluing their, their, their currency, so we buy more of their goods, which is fine with me. They're making their goods cheaper. I hope, hope that all their goods go down to a nickel. That's, that's great. And someone else had their hand up back there. I, I, yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, some people say that the uh, it's a 50% to 60% a month. Yeah, because because at some point people don't want to hold the money. Okay, that is that at the end of the hyperinflation in Germany, uh, German workers were getting paid not once a week, not twice a week. They were getting paid three times a day. No, no, it will accelerate because people try to beat it. 
by buying more goods. And the more goods they buy, the faster prices rise, the more money government has to print to keep up with it. Okay. Yeah, I, we don't need more time for questions. I just got the sign from Mark Thornton. But thank you.